Welcome to Dr. C's Excellent Adventures. Today we're hiking Red Mountain, which is my nominee for the best short hike in northern Arizona. We'll see if we can convince you that that's true. Before we begin our hike, some background info. Red Mountain is just one of over 600 extinct volcanoes in northern Arizona's San Francisco Peaks volcanic field. Red Mountain is an example of a cinder cone, a relatively small volcano built by a series of Strombolian eruptions like this one. Each layer exposed in the walls of the volcano is formed from ejecta deposited by a separate explosion. So thousands of explosions were required to build a volcano approximately a thousand feet tall. Contrary to information on the sign at the trailhead, current evidence suggests this eruptive sequence took place about 700,000 years ago. Riggs and Duffield published a detailed study of Red Mountain in 2008. They documented a complex eruptive history for the volcano, in which part of the cone was rafted away to the west, followed by eruption of what we call agglutinate lavas. The key point for us is that today's hike won't take us into the original volcanic crater, which was located on the opposite side of the ridge in front of us. Our hike begins in the Pinyon Pine Juniper Forest Life Zone. Pinions are distinguished from Ponderosa Pines by having shorter needles which occur in bundles of two instead of three and small globular cones with relatively large seeds. This area was hit with a severe drought in the 1990s which killed many of the pinions but very few of the junipers. Winds from a severe thunderstorm in 2006 knocked down many of the dead pinions and one very large live ponderosa further up the trail. At this point the trail joins a wash which will lead us right up into the amphitheater of Red Mountain. Cliff Rose, a favorite food of mule deer, grows in dense thickets along the trail here. This close-up shows some of the blossoms that have gone to seed, growing long tassels that help with dispersal. As you continue, note that the wash is divided by channel bars into what's called a braided stream pattern. The large boulders you see were all transported from Red Mountain at some point by flash flooding. Look carefully and you'll find shiny black minerals in the sand. These are not pieces of obsidian, but rather are a mix of the minerals hornblende and pyroxene. These isolated crystals are called xenocrysts. Foreign rock fragments made of multiple crystals are called xenoliths. You can find crystal faces on some of the xenocrysts, but they tend to be pitted and rounded off, evidence that they were being resorbed by the magma before the eruption. As late as 2005, there were two large ponderosas standing guard to mark our entry to the Red Mountain Ponderosa Pine Forest Life Zone. Ponderosas have wide, shallow root systems, and unfortunately one of them was uprooted by that windstorm of 2006. This is an outcrop of some of the rock that makes up this flank of Red Mountain, and it's really interesting because it doesn't have very distinct layering in it. You'll notice that it has a yellowish sort of tinge, rather than the typical black of cinder cones. And it's really glued together. Uh, geologists call that uh, strongly cemented. This might be a clue as to what's going on with this volcano. The strangest thing you're going to encounter in this hike is this. You're probably thinking, what on earth is a wall doing out here in the middle of this canyon? Well, this thing is a dam that was built to form a stock tank back in the 1930s by the ranchers out here. And they didn't know their geology very well because within two years, completely filled with sediment. So the surface we're going to be walking on from here on postdates 
the 1930s, where I'm standing right here, is where the land was before they built this. And it's a really striking example of, you know, geologic processes on a human sort of time scale. We're standing in what appears to be a fault zone here, and the thing that's interesting is you can see the rocks are nice and black for the most part on this side. There's some yellowish streaks running through there. And then if we pan around to this side, look at how much more yellow the rock layers look. And we're going to have a, a close look at that. And you can clearly see the yellow-orange tinge to the rocks here. The fine layering is pretty indistinct. And what's going on here is the larger chunks, like these guys, the lapilli, the walnut size and slightly larger pieces within this, are, have maintained their original black color. The finer material has been altered by the action of groundwater. And the orange and yellow color thus postdates the volcanic eruption. And these minerals are hydrated iron oxide minerals. Uh, Gertite and limonite are the two most common of them. So here's a volcanic rock that's yellow-orange in color, but it's not the direct result of the eruption. It's uh, the result of processes that occurred after the eruption. The valley leading into the amphitheater lines up with the trace of the Mesa Butte Fault, a major barrier to the flow of groundwater in this area. Riggs and Duffield argued that abundant water seeping up along the fault altered the cinder cone, cementing the eastern flank. According to them, residual heat from the magma caused steam pressure to build up until finally a steam explosion blew out this section of the cone. Once the cone was breached, groundwater and especially running water carved out the landscape we see today. The pitting you see throughout the amphitheater is called tophony and is the result of differential solution of mineral cement by groundwater. To your left, as you enter the amphitheater, you'll find a slot canyon, a type of canyon carved by running water when the rate of downcutting is much higher than the rate of lateral erosion. It is possible to climb partway up the slot canyon, at least for the young and spry, although the head of this little canyon ends in a vertical cliff. In places, you can find lava bombs embedded in the layers of cinders. Bombs form from blobs of liquid magma that begin to solidify in the air when blasted out of the volcano. Contrary to a certain bad Hollywood movie, they don't explode on impact. The embedded lava bombs are much more resistant to erosion than the layers of cinders. In places, erosion has carved deeply into the cinder layers, creating spires called hoodoos, which are protected by lava bomb caps. In addition to fascinating geology, the Red Mountain Trail sports a variety of plant and animal life from two different forest life zones. Come on, dude, run off into the... There we go. Yeah, excellent. Okay. In the spring, peregrine falcons nest in some of the cavities high on the cliff, while summer is a good time to look for reptiles. Flowers and insects are present from early spring well into the fall. Red Mountain packs a lot of features of scientific interest into a small area, but beyond that is its aesthetic appeal. 
Hollywood set designers would be hard-pressed to top some parts of Red Mountain. If you hike Red Mountain, I highly recommend going in the morning when the amphitheater is lit up by the rising sun. As always in Arizona, take plenty of water and avoid this place during thunderstorms. Guided hikes to Red Mountain can be booked through the Museum of Northern Arizona's Ventures program. And if you post pictures of Red Mountain, I'd love to see them.